Thank you for letting me be here again. I appreciate it so much. I've enjoyed the service so far today, and it's good, you know, to be here. I don't get to be here all the time and once in a while, and it's good when you come in, you see new faces. That's always exciting and stuff, and it's good to see you here today. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about a church like this. Uh, not only ha has it lasted for 26 years, but, you know, they're still preaching the same thing. Things haven't changed, right? And the service that will be conducted today would be just like a service that would have been conducted pretty much back then, you know. And uh, there's something about standing and preaching against sin and preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that just is, you know, timeless and the way it ought to be. And sad that too many churches have gone off in another direction. But I praise the Lord for the steadfastness of this church. I'm thankful for the ministry of this church and thankful for your pastor and his friendship. Thankful for the brain massage show. And I'm telling you, man, some Saturday mornings I really need my brain to be worked really well. And so I appreciate his uh, art in doing that. But anyway, and it's a blessing. And so I'm going to ask you to go back with me to Numbers chapter 21. We were there in Sunday school. Go back here this morning. Numbers chapter 21. I grew up in church and watching those little kids pretty awesome. I get the pastor of the church that I grew up in. I've been pastoring there for 32 years, so I've had that same experience. You know, you see them grow up, and then they become deacons, or they're called to preach. They go off and, and things, or their kids are doing things, and it is fun to watch that and to be able to be a part of all of that. And so uh, just, uh, I was just thinking about some of those boys sitting there, you know, who maybe God called to preach or whatever and things. It's just uh, awesome just to kind of understand and know that, hey, church still works. It still works, and it's amazing how God designed it and how relevant it would be for us. In Sunday school, we begin to look at this story here in Numbers 21. Israel had uh, been to the promised land, but they had failed to trust God. And so they're not there yet. And so in this extended journey now that God put them on, they need to travel north to get to where they need to go. But... Because of the Edomites' unwillingness to cooperate, they had to go south. They had to go around the land of the Edomites. And so it's pretty frustrating. It's out of the way. And like most of us, they hate taking detours. And, uh, and so then at this time, uh, Aaron had just died. And for 30 days, they had mourned for him. After that, they had been attacked by the king of the Canaanites, Arad, and uh, they had taken some of the people captive. And so they had prayed and sought God, and God had given them victory over them and gained those people back. And then this is what happens. We saw this in Sunday school in verses 4 and 5. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water. And our soul loatheth this light Bread. So they got discouraged, the Bible says, because of the way. Their reaction to the situation was discouragement. And discouragement led them to verbally attack the Lord, to verbally attack Moses, and to complain about their situation. They're discontent, they're complaining, they're irrational. And we'd have to say that soul discouragement really is not a good thing. And it just would be true that if they had kept their lives close to the Lord, their reaction to the difficulties in the way would have been so much different. And uh, God would have encouraged them. I read these verses in the Sunday school. I just want to kind of remind you. In Psalm 145, verses 17 through 19, it says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy in all His works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon Him, to all that call upon Him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear Him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. You see, if they had called upon the Lord in truth, it would have been a different situation. In Psalm 20, verses 1 and 2, it says, The Lord hear thee in the day of trouble. 
The name of the God of Jacob defend thee. Send thee help from the sanctuary and strengthen thee out of Zion. Psalm 138.3 says, In the day when I cried, thou answeredest me and strengthenest me with strength in my soul. So I cannot stress enough that these days of trial that we live in, we need to understand it's just a reminder we have to draw closer to the Lord each and every day. If not, we're subject, our, subjecting ourselves to uh, discouragement. And, and, you know, discouragement leads to complaining and even attacking God and, and the man of God. And we need to be careful. And so I just remind you about the nation of Israel that they have uh, done this complaining before. This is not the first time, believe it or not, that they have complained. They complained at the Red Sea. They complained at the Red Sea. They said something like, hey, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us out in the wilderness to die? They uh, complained uh, at Mara about the bitter waters. The Bible says the people murmured against Moses. They, er they, they, they complained there early in their journey about well, something like food. The Bible says, and they murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They, they murmured in Rephidim. All right, The people did chide with Moses, it says there in Exodus 17. They murmured against him. And again in Numbers 11, it said the people complained. At the brink of the promised land, when they could have gone in and they were not obeying God, the people murmured against Moses and against Aaron. The people did chide. One more time, in Rome, Numbers 23, the chief people did chide with Moses. Uh, would God that we had died when our brethren had died before the Lord. I don't know about you, but I read all of that. You read through the history there of Israel, and it's like they just keep complaining over and over again. And, uh, you know, would God we had died in Egypt? Now, why would they even say that? I mean, just the foolishness. We agree in our pious spirits that they did a lot of complaining. Of course, if we were honest, we probably have complained more than that this week, but that's just another thing. That's them, not us, all right? Uh, well, God had been long-suffering and gracious through all of this. Can, can I just remind you, God is long-suffering and God is gracious. That is the nature of our God. Far too often we have this idea that God's got a big bully you know, club up there, billy club or whatever it is, and he, you know, he's waiting to pound somebody on the head for just getting out. of But our God is long-suffering and gracious, and he's proved that over and over. Did you know at the Red Sea, of course, he delivered them and destroyed Pharaoh. At Mara, he gave them a, a tree to put in the water to make the water sweet, to make it drinkable. When they complained about a lack of food, God sent them bread from heaven. At Rephidim, he gave them water out of the rock. And one more time, God gave them water out of the rock. You know, a carnal Christian would come along and say, well, yeah, you know, when the people complained, then God took care of them. I guess, you know, that's kind of the way it worked. A mature Christian would say, hey, God was helping them to learn that God took care of them. The complaining was certainly not necessary. And be careful in thinking that complaining is the way you get things done. Be careful, Christian. Our God has a vast supply. My God can supply all our needs according to His riches in glory. And we don't have to go through the middleman of complaint to access what God wants to supply us. So here in this story, God's had enough. Scary to stop and think about that for a moment. In this story we're reading here in Numbers 21, God's have, has had enough. So let's read on. Will you stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word today? Numbers 21, and I'll pick it up there in verse number 6. So they've just gotten done complaining, and the Bible says, And the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that we, he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent. 
and set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if any uh, serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld uh, the serpent of brass, he lived. He lived. Let's pray. Father, help us today. Lord, we certainly need you to speak to us. Lord, would you do that today? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. God had judged his people for complaining. He sent fiery serpents among them, snakes, not just snakes, but nasty, fiery snakes. And many people were bitten. And of course, we read many people were dying. And uh, I want to show you some things that we can learn from this. We, we have to remind ourselves, we have to be careful what we do wrong. We have to be careful about not quickly repenting when we know we have sin. And I, I first just want to remind you, God judges sin. God judges judges sin. In fact, there's this law, isn't there? In Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, where the Bible says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. I just remind you, God will not be mocked. You can't turn your nose up at God. You can't sneer what, at what God does and expect that things are going to turn out well for you. Now I know uh, we can complain about the president, we can complain about the governor, we can complain about this and that in our homes, and they don't hear us, and so really, well, unless you have Alexa, maybe they do, but anyway, uh, they don't hear us, and so, you know, we're not going to get in trouble for it, but it, whatever we say, whenever we say it, if we just think it, God hears those things. He knows everything. He knows your spirit, and He knows your attitude uh, towards the things that He has for you. He hears both your words and your thoughts. So the Lord put in place this thing called the law of sowing and reaping. What we sow is what we reap. If you complain against the provision of the Lord, well, He may well provide you with something you don't want. You got to think about that. Here in judgment, God sent to these people fiery serpents. I, I, I'm, I hate always to give personal illustrations, but I know what it is to be bitten by a snake. It was a horrible experience. Obviously, I survived. When I was young, uh, uh, my son was playing ball, and I was asked to umpire for a game, you know, these little, little tiny kids. And there was a girl playing on the other team, playing second base. Yes, I said a girl. Don't get me started. That's another story. I looked over. And there was a snake slithering right up behind that little girl playing second base. Even snakes knew the girls should have had their own teams, but that's another story. <laughs> My manly instincts kicked in, and I realized I had to save her. So I went over and I picked that thing up, which is a big thing for me because I was raised in the city. I just want you to know that. And it bit my hand. In fact, it drew blood. I mean, this thing was huge. It was like... 10 inches or so. I mean, it was really, really big. And it was a dreaded Northern California garden snake, you know. <laughs> Nothing like what Israel was doing going on with, all right? So, I mean, you know, not much of an experience there compared to what they're going through. These snakes were actually biting and killing people and causing a lot of fear. I can only imagine what it would have been like. And, uh, and sort of like the virus today causing a lot of fear. So if God judges sin, and this is a judgment for sin, what sin did Israel commit? Well, we could go back and say, well, they were complaining against God, and they allowed their soul to be discouraged. But I, I really want you to see there this thing called pride. Because there's a lot of pride going on in the nation of Israel. In fact, I would say, first of all, we notice it because they had this sense of entitlement. You know, I, I don't really think that's a very good thing for people to have, a sense of entitlement. The Spirit showed that they believe that Moses and Aaron, and thus God, should keep them from suffering any trial. Wow. When they were, thirst, when they were thirsty, hey, there should be water, right? And, uh, you know, they shouldn't have to pray for it. They deserve for it to be right there. When they were hungry, 
There should be food. Hey, they shouldn't have to waste time seeking God's help. It should just be there. There was no thankfulness for the supply of God. They had survived the journey so far, but they were complaining about the way, uh, uh, you know, just another instance of them thinking they had already suffered enough. They deserve better than this. This was just not fair. You know what? You start thinking about that. All of those are symptoms of pride. You can see it in their speaking against God. You know, what good thing had any of them done to deserve God? You know, do something for them? Did they have any right to charge God? You think about that. Man, it's kind of an amazing thing. They're speaking against the man, God's man. In fact, the Bible says about Moses that he was the meekest man upon the face of the earth. And they're speaking against Moses. I, I thought that was interesting that they said, our soul loatheth this light bread. It's kind of an amazing statement. I did a little research, and the word loatheth is a Hebrew word that originated in Spanish and literally means, I need a taco once in a while. No, but anyway, something like that. But, uh, you know, God was feeding them. And they were full. They were not content in their soul. They believed they deserved better. Hmm. They believed Moses and God were not taking care of them the way that they deserved to be taken care of. We get like that, don't we? We get like that with our jobs, with our possessions, with our homes. We get tired of the old. We want something new. How bad is this pride when you think about it? Where is the humility that brings a thankfulness and, you know, and, and for the mercy of God and the supply of God? In their hearts, they should have been singing, you know, God has been good. And they're singing, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. There's a lot of Christians like that today. And, 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 you know, the very fact that they're Christians proves God has been good. And we're walking around like we're so troubled. We've got all these problems. Just pride. Secondly, they complain. Complaining is essentially the same as murmuring. To murmur is to complain with a low voice or with the volume somewhat suppressed. You know, I remember one time I was disciplining, disciplining my daughter. And she went in her room and closed the door. And I could hear. <laughs> going on, I knew I had a situation to deal with. And, uh, you know, because she's in there thinking I couldn't hear what she was saying. And she's in there talking about how unfair and all this stuff I was and things. And boy, we're like that, aren't we? We tend to murmur. Philippians 2.14 says, do all things without murmurings and disputings. And I know, I know, murmuring and complaining is part of our American DNA. It is how, it is how we, we uh, start conversations with people. Really, next time you're in Walmart and there's, you know, somebody up there 12 feet away from you, you know, doing your social distancing, and they turn to speak to you, they won't turn to say, hey, how are you doing? They'll turn to say, can you believe it's taking this long? It's, we just, it's just kind of the way we, we strike up our conversations. This murmuring is expressed as discontentment. As Christians, boy, we need to learn to be content with what God has supplied for us. And having food and raiment, the Bible says, let us be there with content. You know, we don't need riches in this life because our hope is in heaven. It says in Hebrews 13, 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. It's an amazing thing. He's right there. He knows what we need. He knows the situation. Wouldn't contentment then require a thankfulness for what we have? Paul said this, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You've got to think about that for just a little bit. Paul was saying, I know how to be abased, I know how to abound. He said, I know, I know that whatever state I'm in, I'm going to be content. If I have nothing, 
If I have an abundance, I'm going to be content. And then he makes that great statement. He said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. It's kind of like the whole thing we talked about in Sunday school. That closeness to the Lord. Hey, whatever situation I'm in, God's there to give me that strength that I need to deal with that situation. So far too often we have this idea that when he said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, that means we can have whatever we want. No. Understand, whatever state you're in, whatever things are going on, God is there to give you the strength to encourage you, to help you through the things of your life. Wow. Complaining, you know, is like the gift that keeps on giving. One person is discontent, so they complain. Another person hears it, and they complain. It's kind of like the virus. Next thing you know, the NBA stops playing. <laughs> anyway, and stuff, so. It just keeps on giving. Notice their response, though. I like this. I, honestly, here's one place where I, I think uh, they responded now well to the judgment of God. It says in verse 7, Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee, praying to the Lord that he take away uh, the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. This is good. They confessed their sin. Would have been great if they'd have done it before the snakes, but they confessed their sin. It's a sign of repentance. The judgment of God got their attention. By the way, if you, if you feel the hand of God's judgment upon you, it ought to get your attention. Hey, you know, I don't know. I just think across America, we ought to be saying God's getting our attention. I, really, I, I, I'm, I long for the day that we have any of our leaders to stand and say, you know what? These are some things that we don't really know how to deal with. We need help from God. Let's pray. Instead of just symbolically praying, just to be honest and say, hey, we don't know what to do. We need help. Yeah. We need the wisdom of God. God got their attention. I, I think we should be saying God's getting our attention. I mean, you've got hurricanes and, and floods and you've got fires and you've got rioting and you've got a virus and you've got all this discontentment politically. and I mean, all this stuff going on. It's a sign that we're not where we should be. What we need is repentance in our nation. We need to see the judgment of God upon our nation. We ought to be repenting our sins from our, of our sins as a nation. Man, we're wicked. We've done some wicked things as a nation. We've got wicked things going on and we need to repent. By the way, in repentance, no excuses for sin are given. You know, when somebody truly repents, they're not blaming somebody else for what they've done wrong. Confession is what God re requires of us as his people. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To confess is literally to agree with God. When you confess your sins, you're not informing God. He already knows. Basically, confession is saying, Lord, I know you know I did wrong. This is wrong. And my sin is just what you saw. My sin is wicked before you. Confess, agreeing with God that what we've done is wrong. They named their sin. We've spoken against the Lord. We've spoken against Moses. Too often our uh, confessions are, are generic and, and, you know, they're general. They're not specific. You know, it's kind of like the, the politician says, well, if I've, I, if I've offended anybody, <laughs> you know, no. We get specific when we're confessing our sins. We should. They name their sin. Too often, confession is more an attempt to justify what we've done wrong instead of just getting honest with God. Did you know that then it's at this point that God provides a way out of the mess? After verse 7, then the Lord tells Moses to make that fiery serpent and, uh, so that they can look to it and they can be healed from the disease. It's amazing how God always has an answer. And God provides a way, a cure for those that have been bitten by the snakes. And so there's some things I want to point out to you in this. There's a picture of the judgment of sin. Not only were they bitten, but these bites were deadly. Were deadly. Do you know what the Bible says? The wages of sin is death. 
The wages of sin is death. I mean, really, God is giving them an illustration, something that we could use later to show, hey, it is true. When we sin, the judgment for sin is death. And not just physical death. There is a spiritual death. There is a second death. Spending eternity separated God from God in the lake of fire for all eternity. There is that judgment for those that have sinned, that those who that have not repented and turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is that penalty for sin. We should understand, though, that a wage is something is earned. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. It's what we deserve. All of us here, because of our sin, we have earned, we deserve that death, that second death. I'm so glad that there's on the other side of that verse, there's a gift. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. A gift is not something you earn. A gift is something that's given to you because somebody loves you. And good news, somebody loves us. Somebody provided for us a gift of e eternal life we can't earn it he's the one that paid for it and provided it for us i love the verses in psalm 103 verses 8 through 12 he says the lord the bible says the lord is merciful and gracious slow to anger and plenteous in mercy he will not always chide neither will he keep his anger forever he hath not dealt with us after our sins nor rewarded us according to our iniquities for as the heaven is high above the earth so great is his mercy toward them that fear him as far as the east is from the west so far hath he removed our transgressions from us a way of escape from the judgment of our sin has been made. A way of escape was made in those days. Days God told Moses to take that serpent, make a brazen serpent, and put it upon the pole so when the people were bitten, they could look and be saved from that. And I'm so glad that our God has made a way for us to be forgiven for the judgment of our sins. See, God has a plan for defeating death. Only our God can do that. And so... Uh, the serpent on the pole in this story was God's plan. He didn't remove the snakes. Could have done that. But he didn't. He, instead of that, he gave them the opportunity that when they were bitten, they could look to the serpent upon the pole and be healed. You know, the Bible tells us that God has conquered death. In Isaiah 25, 8, he will swallow up death in victory and that's exactly what he did when he conquered death through his death burial and resurrection he conquered death he swallowed it up in victory it is our enemy the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death but i'm glad that our god is greater than our enemy i'm glad i serve a god who can do what no one else can do he can do the impossible he doesn't rely on luck he doesn't rely on chance you know what he has all power Seriously, there is no curative power in a brazen serpent on a pole. You know, in faith, when people looked to the pole, in faith, God used His power to effect the healing. None of us, if we were out, you know, guys on some kind of a guy camping trip and, you know, a, a rattlesnake pulled up and bit somebody, we wouldn't say, hey, let's make a pole and let's put a brazen serpent on it so he can be healed. It's not what we would do, right? We understand, do you? Understand there is no power in the pole. There was no power in the serpent on the pole. It was God who affected that. When men looked to that pole, when they looked at that thing, God's the one that healed them. God's the one who has all the power. It's not the power of the serpent, it was the power of the Savior, the Savior who healed them. He made it easy, didn't he? He made it easy for them who had been bitten to be saved. So he makes this fiery serpent, and uh, later it's called Nehushtan, which means a thing of brass. And the brass would, you know, in, Bi in the Bible, it kind of pictures the fire, and so this fiery serpent. And uh, he instructed to put it on a pole. A, a pole was like an ensign, something that you could raise up the flag upon and show people whose side they were on. So the people were instructed that when they were bitten by a serpent, they could look to that pole, look to that serpent, and they would be healed. You know, they didn't have to go searching for it. It was there where they could see it. 
And I guess my point is this. Salvation is not far away. The salvation of lost souls is not something difficult to find. It's not something that, you know, takes years and years for someone to discover. In fact, in Acts 17, 27, it says that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. In fact, there's several of us here. It was so easy. When we were kids, we got saved. I mean, it's just amazing how close it is. The way of salvation is not far away. It's not hard to find. In fact, for these people, all they had to do was look. They had to look to that serpent upon the pole. It was an act of faith. An act of faith that said, hey, I know what the answer is. I believe. It's not an act of works. It's an act of faith. When the people looked, the mercy and grace of God was bestowed upon them, just like it is and we turn to the Lord in, our, in faith for our salvation. Wow, the preacher said today, you don't get saved by baptism. Baptism, hey, you know what? It's looking to the pole. It's looking to the pole. Well, what do you mean? Well, Jesus made reference to that. Did not, you remember that in John chapter 3? He's speaking to Nicodemus. And he said this, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have e eternal life. Again, Jesus is speaking to this Nicodemus, this religious man. And basically, he told him, you may be religious, but you're not good enough. Unless you're born again, you can't enter into the kingdom of God. It's amazing how many people have this idea that if they're religious, if they attend church, if they do good things, that somehow they've earned the right to salvation, that they're heirs of the kingdom, but they're not. You have to be born again. That's what Jesus was telling Nicodemus. And he's explaining to him what Jesus himself would have to do to effect that new birth. He, like the serpent in the wilderness, was lifted up. Jesus himself, the Son of Man, would have to be lifted up. You know, it was not enough for Moses to just make the brazen serpent. He had to put it where it could be seen. It was a must. By the way, what good is a cure if no one can find it? Can anybody say hydra? Oh, but anyway, I don't want to go there. But anyway, <laughs> Jesus was here. He was the answer. But he had to be lifted up. He had to be lifted up. It was a must. It was a must. How, boy, when I read that, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It may not tugs at my heart. Because I realize for my life, if he had not met that requirement, I would have no hope, neither would you. He must. Jesus understood it as an imperative for him that he go to the cross of Calvary to pay the price for your sin and for my sin. What an amazing thought that he would be willing to do that for us. It was a must. He was lifted up on the cross of Calvary that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Wow. That men could believe to the saving of their souls. That men like Nicodemus and men like you and me that would not have to perish and not have to spend one moment of time in the lake of fire, not have to suffer that second death. That men could have eternal life. Wow. There may be some of you here that are still in your snake-bitten condition. What do you mean, preacher? You're still in your sin. Did you know that until a person gets saved, they're still under the condemnation of God? They're still under the judgment of God? The wrath of God abides on them. It's not until a person is saved, a person repents of their sin, that that wrath is taken away. And so, you know, they're in that situation. They're still in that snake bit situation. They haven't looked to the Savior yet. The Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I remind you, death is coming. As sure as when those people would die as a result of those snake bites, I'm telling you, death is coming for all of us. And if we die in that situation, rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ, there is no hope. Hmm. Why would you wait? If you're here this morning listening to what I'm saying and you know you need to be saved, why would you wait? Why would you wait? Can you imagine getting bitten by a snake 
and watching maybe, you know, in the leg, watching your leg swell up and stuff. And people are going, hey, just look to this, the pole. Nah, when I, when I will. In, in my time. I just want to kind of see what happens. The foolishness of that. I know that your preacher has done the same. You have people sometimes, they're in a service, and you know and they know that they need to be saved, and you watch them. Just keep putting it off. Hey, I'm telling you, it's serious stuff. Look now. Get saved now. Don't put it, put it off. 26 years. It's pretty awesome. 26 years. The gospel has been preached from and out of Lighthouse Baptist Church. People have been saying, hey, look, there's the answer. Look to the pole. Look to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the answer. Just remind you of the job as a church that we have to do. So person's bitten. Then they're told by Moses to look to the serpent on the pole. And they look and they're healed. And it is hallelujah time. It's hallelujah time. So they walk away. Listen to this. So they walk away. They've been healed. And there's someone else that's been bitten. And they just keep on walking. And they see somebody else over here and they just keep on walking. I, I, I can't imagine anybody would do that. Wouldn't they say, whoa, 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 look to the pole. You can, you, you'll, be, you'll be healed. Look, 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 look. Look. They'd be telling everybody they could. What's my point? We looked to the Lord Jesus Christ and we got saved. <laughs> we have eternal life. But there's people around us that are dying in their sins. And we have a responsibility, an imperative, if you will, to tell them. Because if we don't tell them, who's going to tell them? And if we don't tell them, they'll die in that situation. We need to be doing our part to pointing folks to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this church is about. Preaching against sin and telling people the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know what? That's what we need to keep doing. However long God gives this church. It's exactly what needs, we need to keep doing. Keep preaching the gospel. The gospel is the answer. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, the gospel is the answer. If you're here today and you're saved, maybe God's showing you some things. Maybe it's just the lack of Concern about those that are lost and dying. Maybe God's telling us, listen, it's time to get serious about bringing folks to Christ. But let's deal with the Lord this morning. Let's have our heads bowed as we prepare for our invitation time. If you're here this morning and you're not saved, I would encourage you, and I know it gets difficult sometimes, people, other people around and things like that, but I want you to know people have been praying and we want to do our best to help you Come to know Christ as your Savior. In just a little bit, we'll sing a song. We call it the invitation song. We invite people to respond to the preaching of the Word of God. If you'll come to the altar, there'll be somebody who'll come and help you and show you how to trust Christ as your Savior. It's a matter of faith. We'd love for you to do that today, and I would encourage you. The rest of us, if God's speaking to us, hey, certainly the altar is open for us. Let's pray. Father, thank you this morning. God, for the truth that is there, Lord, that Jesus Christ, though I was in my sin, lost and undone without hope, yet, God, you had provided a way of salvation for me. And I thank you that one day as a young boy, the message came clear and distinct to me that Jesus Christ had died for my sins and was buried and it rose again so that I could be saved. And then, Lord, that night I got saved. Thank you so much. I pray that everyone here, God, will be saved. Lord, not one would die in their sins. Bless this invitation, Lord, for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.